Hi everyone, can you already hear me? Uh, there's no translator, so it's all going to be with this accent, I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, you can leave now. Um, hey, first of all, thank you for staying late. I think I'm um, the last talk here today, so I appreciate uh, the enthusiasm. Um, what I want to talk about today was how we, a fairly small startup, are making use of S3. Um, and I, um, I do know that that's not what the uh, acronym usually stands for, but I thought that I would give you a preview of what we do with it. Um, so I wanted to share some of what, uh, what uh, S3 has enabled us to do at Cadre in terms of speeding up development. Uh, you know that uh, it's, it's sort of the bane of every startup to, to need about 10 times as many engineers as we ever have. So anything we can do that helps us accelerate our work is, is uh, a huge win for us. Um, for context, I'm going to share a little bit about what Cadre does, uh, why we do it, the kind of technical challenges that we take on, and, and then we'll dig a little bit deeper into S3 and how we leverage it. Um, I'll, uh, most likely I save time for questions at the end, but if there's a pressing question, just raise your hand and we'll just, we'll just take it you know, from there. Um, so Cadre, at a very high level, came about uh, about three years ago out of a vision that our CEO and founder Ryan had um, to bring alternative assets to a much broader base of investors and in case you don't know what alternative assets are they're effectively non-traditional investments um, that are way less liquid harder to value and, and way more complex than you know stocks um, and and so when i said just earlier that we're building the first ever sort of digital stock market for alternative investments that's essentially our way to say that we're bringing um, the, mo the modern way of trading that everyone is kind of used to when it comes to ETFs and stocks to the world of alternative assets that have been uh, essentially way more complex than that traditionally. Okay? Uh, initially, we're focusing on commercial real estate as the first asset class we're going after. Over time, we'll expand well beyond that. So more, more interestingly than what we're doing, the question is why? Um, and the reason Ryan started the company and sort of what really got him excited about the prospect is that the asset class is by far uh, one of the most, the highest performing asset classes you can, you can potentially invest in, right? Uh, just a, a few sort of like data points, right? It's outperformed the S&P 500 significantly for the last 30 years with only half the volatility, so that sounds great, right? Um, the downside is that through sort of like structural inefficiency, it's an asset class that's only been available to the largest institutional investors, right? So here's an interesting dilemma. You have this amazing instrument, this interesting sort of financial product, right, that actually has been at the um, at the core of, of a lot of like what, what you see when you dig into where sort of like multi-generational wealth has come from, you, you always find commercial real estate somewhere in there. And in spite of that, it's, it's an asset class that's essentially inaccessible to you know, mere mortals like you and me, right? And we started the company because we wanted more members of our society to be able to participate, right? That's essentially the impetus behind, behind Cadre, right? Um, it's a very ambitious you know, goal, and so how do we actually take that on? And the answer, you know, I'm not going to surprise anyone in this crowd, the answer is very much centered on technology, right? The reason the asset class is only accessible to so few is because every problem traditionally has been answered by throwing very expensive labor at it, right? And as a result, you know, the traditional players in that world can only afford to engage with those participants who can afford to write the largest checks because but what happens then is that you're essentially spreading that manual labor cost across like a large dollar amount and so it makes it it makes it possible to run a business if you rethink this from the ground up with technology as 
your weapon of choice to go and take on every bottleneck, every bit of friction, then you can actually turn things around and make this asset class accessible to a much broader base of investors. Okay. Um, at a very high level, investing in alternative assets is, is a pretty straightforward sort of proposition, right? You effectively are thinking of it as a two-sided marketplace where on the one side you have your operators, people whose job it is to go and figure out buildings that they want to invest in and buy and operate, uh, but they don't want to put up the money. Just like, you know, I don't want to pay how, uh, uh, cash for a house that I want to live in. You know, I want to find a way to fund that, that purchase. Well, those guys are the same. They want to stretch their dollars. They want to find a way to leverage, you know, their, their positions. And so um, they need to find people like Cadre to essentially be partners with them and help them finance these transactions, right? And Cadre does that by turning around and essentially engaging with our clients, investors, and those can be anywhere from family offices to high net worth individuals to over time just about anybody. And we're essentially creating a marketplace where these two parties and counterparties can find each other and transact, right? So now you see where this notion of like a, a stock market, so to speak, for this type of assets come from. Right. Traditionally, the options that have been available to non sort of ultra high net worth individuals have been limited uh, and have all come with a lot of drawbacks, limitations from a sort of uh, liquidity standpoint or limitation from a, a sort of like availability standpoint in terms of like the stuff that you get to buy is actually of lesser quality. For instance, these are just some examples. Right. With, with what we do, we actually use the fact that we're transforming every bit of manual process into a system that's powered by software. We're able to essentially create way more flexibility in our system. So for instance, we allow people to invest in specific deals as opposed to you know, buying into a fund and then being trapped there. We also create liquidity through a secondary marketplace that allows people to exchange shares in a building as opposed to having to wait for the building to actually be sold, right? We, of course, you know, use our expertise and build on it and tap uh, multiple sources of data that could have, you know, everything to do with real estate or demographic information or financial data and then use that to further how much diligence we can do so that we can actually get better, b better buildings onboarded onto the platform. Um, and the same is kind of true on the other side of the marketplace when it comes to the people who traditionally engage with building operators. They are very restricting, restrictive terms. Um, you're also limited in terms of like how long you can hold the property. So, we also aim to be a much better partner for those people, right? We guarantee the funding. We can potentially offer them like evergreen capital. Uh, and of course, we give them tools to manage their assets. Uh, today, again, we're in commercial real estate. Over time, you can imagine infrastructure, energy, transportation, and other types of asset classes that are also alternative assets, okay? Um, so that's kind of like why we're doing what we're doing, how we're taking on various types of challenges. And what I wanted to do now was dig in a little bit further into how we manage um, storing very sensitive documents. The minute you step back and you think about what we do, it's a lot about onboarding information that is you know, financial in nature, that is very sensitive, that pertains to um, both transactions that people do on the platform, uh, information about their general sort of financial lives that we need to understand so that we can determine how well suited they are to invest on the platform. So that comes with a lot of constraints, both in terms of you know, regulatory constraints and of course in terms of like integrity constraints, security, storage requirements. I'll just give you a few, right? Um, the um, sort of the regulatory organizations that we have to comply with and, and work with, you know, impose, you know, things that won't surprise you, but that are very stringent in terms of regulations. For instance, 
um, the holding period for the documents that we circulate to our investors, six years, right? The fact that there's a, an aspect of immutability to the, compo to, to the documents that we share. Right? Once, once you've shared the document, you can't change it anymore. If you're gonna make a change, you need to version that document. Um, the fact that you need to be able to maintain an audit trail and the ability to go back and audit things for 18 months. Um, the fact that you need to be able to easily retrieve that document for um, regulators to, to search it if, if need be, right? So these are some of the constraints that we, uh, we operate it. Um, and of course, you know, you want end-to-end you want -end encryption um, on, on the, um, the channel and you also want address encryption. And then of course you want to make sure that you can, you can um, keep these documents tamper-proof. Right. So for all these reasons, uh, we had to make decisions. Right. How do we go about building that? And what's the system that we need to build? And what are the tools we can build on? So, again, unsurprisingly, given given the the, the, the you know the title of the talk, um, we landed on S3, um, and it won't surprise you. Um, but, but we had to go and do a lot of work to figure out whether that was the tool for us, right? What ultimately decided um, in S3's favor are, you know, the points that I'm going to cover now. So effectively, one of the most appealing components of that was sort of like the life cycle rules that S3 provides. Um, I'll show you some samples of how you can declare all these policies in a bit, but the fact that you could essentially define the retention period and enforce that um, through, this, through these policies. The fact that we had natively a way to track each version that we would create of a document and ensure that uh, there would be an audit trail for that. Um, and the fact that potentially we could actually move all these documents to Glacier over time so that we could save on cost as the volume grew, right? Um, to be very specific, right, every API call can be tracked with CloudTrail and every um, direct access call can also be tracked. We were also able to do identical backups across regions, so it increases our reliability, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, all important to us, encryption and to end an encryption at rest, right? So for all these reasons, we, uh, we chose to go with S3, and you can imagine the alternative, right? We would have had to go and build that sort of like from scratch and reinvent all these, you know, access control rules and lifecycle rules, and we would have had to do that without the benefit of the fact that there are so many people using that, that should a bug have been present, we would have benefited from, you know, millions of eyeballs looking at that and helping us essentially um, solve it, right? Whereas if we did it ourselves, it would have been, you know, just like, the 15 of us in engineering at Cadre, right? By the way, we're also hiring, so that number needs to grow to 50. So if anyone feels like they need to come and help us solve these problems, please come and find me. Um, so I mentioned replication earlier across regions. So we have a primary bucket, right? And it, it's set up to only allow get and put operations. It's, uh, it's of course, fully encrypted. Uh, and we have turned on versioning so that, you know, should you try to update a document, you will essentially automatically create another version, right? Um, and then we set up replication to a different bucket so that we have a backup, okay? Um, this is a bit too small to read, but essentially it's the same thing. Um, I just explain in English uh, for those who prefer to read code. Um, and then we have a mirror bucket that effectively is set up so that you can only get and replicate. And of course, encryption and versioning are also set up there, right? Same idea. Uh, very important to us, the audit trail that I mentioned earlier. So it's done through the fact that we set up logging uh, and that we store that also on S3 in a bucket. So every operation that happens is effectively tracked uh, in a way that we can go back and revisit later. Uh, we store everything for 18 months. So that should we be asked uh, you know, for a trail of what happened, we are able to produce that pretty much instantaneously, right? Um, just to summarize sort of how we actually put all the pieces together, um, when someone internally at Cadre wants to upload documents for the benefit of our investors, 
you know, there's a single REST call that is made to our servers. And then we sort of like split that into two, and we first process the metadata about that document to our own store. Uh, we're essentially running Postgres on Aurora on, on RDS, right? And then we hit S3 and we upload the actual file, right? And from that, we get a version number and a file ID, and then we update uh, our metadata to store that. And if that fails, then we roll back. It's actually pretty straightforward. So that allowed us to essentially get all these features without any of the work. So uh, we, um, we've been doing that for about, about a year now, and uh, I've been very pleased with it, both in terms of feature richness and, and performance. Um, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover today in terms of uh, what we're about. I'd love to uh, answer any question if you have any about the business, about the technology we're, we're using, or about anything really.